Good evening, good evening, welcome very, very much to Conversations. I'm pleased to welcome to the pro program Greg Tarpinian, and Greg Tarpinian is the executive director of a very interesting organization here in New York City called the Labor Research Association. And uh, Greg, welcome very much to Conversations and to Thanks, Harold. Manhattan Neighborhood Network. I wonder if maybe you could. We want to talk about the economy, we want to, particularly from a labor perspective and so forth. But I wonder, it, it's a long history, the association. It goes back many, many years. And I wonder if maybe you could share with me and the cable audience the Labor Research Association as a historical institution. Well, we could talk about some you know, current problems and so forth. We're an independent labor think tank. Right. Uh, we provide research, uh, educational, and economic forecasting services for labor unions, right. principally. We were founded in the uh, late 1920s uh, and really grew in the early in the 1930s in the period in which the the uh, union movement in this country grew. Right. Um, and we were really uh, on the ground floor of the development of a strong uh, labor movement in the United States. Yeah. And we're still there today, uh, independent. Um, funded by but not beholden to any particular union. I see, yeah. And you, were there, you got started in the, in the 20, and into the 30s, as you say, when the labor mu movement was, uh, was really moving strong. Those were really, in a certain sense, heady days, weren't they? I mean, the yeah. Ford strike. And I mean, it was really coming down to where there was the, the, the Congress was taking acts toward even allowing the idea of collective bargaining to be something that could be uh, acceptable in right. terms and of I, a I, traditional I, pattern of seeing things. Our organization was there yeah. uh, a good 10 years before things really took off. Right. Uh, so there was a groundwork being laid. Right. We provided the kind of intellectual basis for uh, the people in the field, union organizers going out in there talking to workers and, uh, and trying to advance their cause. Very often at their own peril. Yeah, in, in many many of the, the different industries. Uh, we produced, for example, at that time, we had newsletters for coal industry oh. people, for people in the shoe and leather industries, for people in the, in the garment industry, right. people in the railroad industry, and so forth. Now we have two publications. We have a bi-weekly uh, called the Trade Union Advisor, which is an economic forecasting publication for oh. trade union leaders. Oh. And we have a monthly called Economic Notes, which is a, a digest of economic and political trends. Right. On top of that, we do specific consulting for unions in strikes, organizing drives, uh, and various other activities that they're involved in, legislative, political, and so forth. I don't want to get hung up in this, in this, uh, in this historical thing, but we, I think we have a, we have a, common, uh, a, a common liking for the kind of political satire of Michael Moore. Uh -huh. Michael Moore has been on recently, and he, he did the Roger and Me, and he went back to the, ancient, the old days with Flint organizing in the automobile industry and so forth. And there's this rich, powerful tradition of labor organization. And I, well, we're jumping from that, and in the realization of you know, John Lewis and all of the steps that were developed in the, in the labor union movement that saw the living standards of the people in this country, the working people in this country, rise consistently with productivity and so forth. I wonder, what is your view of the labor movement Today, we'll take a jump. We can talk at the in-between period. Well, there's but what has happened, because many people see, particularly since PAPCO, that the labor union movement had been severely attacked and is, uh, is, in, the, is in the retreat. I wonder if maybe you could put out the broad dimension of the way you see things now. Well, right now, we're, when all is said and done, when we look at statistical yeah. portrait, 11.5% right. of the private sector workforce belongs to a union. Only which is about where it was in 1930 really? on the eve of the, of the organizing drives that's, before the Wagner Act. That's interesting. So we're at our weakest point numerically, uh, proportionate workforce. And that's coming down uh, from a high of what? From a high of about 35% in the mid-1950s. I see, okay. right, okay. So you've seen a substantial reduction. That's been really continuous. It took a big hit in the 1980s with Reagan. Sure did. But Reagan was really a reflection of bigger, th of bigger things that were going on in the world economy. Yeah. Uh, and the Reagan policies were the same policies pursued by Thatcher in England, by coal in Germany, and all the way down the line uh -huh. that coincided with this new globalization of, of, of the economy yeah. um, and uh, the deindustrialization 
uh, industrialization of a lot of the world. Yeah. Or now you've got the whole of Eastern Europe that can be deindustrialized, or the Soviet Union now that that's collapsed and so forth. That that model has collapsed, and so so it's it's a challenging time in the yeah. standpoint of the interests of the working people within our economy. Well, since 1973, working class people have seen their incomes decline after inflation, after taxes. That's really something that's got a lot of economists scratching their head. The productivity keeps going up, and, and it always had been, if I may, the wages and benefits and so forth had gone up in tandem with productivity rises. But since 1973, if I'm not mistaken, Productivity still goes up in a certain sense, but the the, the 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 benefits to the to not only I think the working class, but to the society at least it's maybe sensed. By I don't want to talk to you about the distinction between the working class and the middle class and that sort of. But the, by the sense by the society as a whole, that their prospects are not. In, are either stagnating or are becoming worse. And that's a widely perceived uh, uh, sentiment among the people in the United States. We're talking about middle class angst. But that, 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 that's some, there's something unique about 1973 or that trend. Well, there. 1973 uh, captured, or the early 1970s captured a, a lot of, of new things yeah, at yeah. once. One was the oil shortage, right, right which led right. to the rise in prices, which, mm -hmm. which really transformed the role of the U.S. in the world as well. Uh, led to an inflationary spiral, or yeah. at least was part of that. You had the U.S. going off the gold standard, so currencies became uh, international and fluctuated. That was about 74, uh, right? Yeah. yeah. And then you had, um, at the same time, you had the, uh, the, the the end of the Vietnam War. Yeah, that's true. And the loss of U.S. hegemony and power in the world. Yeah. Um, Finally, what you had was the rise of the Southeast Asian nations, the rise of Japan and Germany coming yeah. into maturity, yes. uh, and an intensification of global competition. We were no longer the big power on the, on, on the economic scene. Uh -huh. um, so what you, what you see at that time is both a weakening of the industries in which unions exist, and therefore a weakening of the unions themselves um, and a restructuring process That's that began then. A weakening of the industries themselves in terms of, uh, I mean, in, in, relative to global competition. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Coming under intense pressure. I mean, the, the growth of the unions took place in a period where the U.S. economy was rather, se was, yeah, was self-sustained right. and uh, uh, it's a new world today. Sure um, it so it's, it's similar to the new world that uh, people entered in the, in the early 1930s when they began to organize labor unions and the new industries, which That's at that time were auto steel and, and so forth. That's an interesting analogy. Uh, it's one that might be something we want to talk about, that sort of thing. It's happening. We've just passed GATT, the Uruguay Round. We've established this world trade organization. Many people felt that went through very quickly with it being as important as it is. Is it inevitable that, as Marshall McLuhan said, we live in a global village? Uh, communications is easy to understand in a certain sense with satellites and fax mail and email and all of these things that are making this a village for business people and for capital, very easy to move. Was it, was it uh, in terms of the moving of actual goods and goods, let's say, rather than services or information, but goods, I mean, you had the containerization and the, is there, has there been a revolution in transportation that's made it possible for the world to become the context within which business decisions are made rather than national or regional context? Has there been a, some sort of revolution in transportation that's made this possible? And was the containerization process for moving things around physically part of that? And uh, I wonder well, how, how, did we, how did the stevedores and the longshoremen deal with that technological challenge? And they dealt with it by negotiating job security clauses to grandfather the existing workforce. Okay. Uh, but ultimately that, that led to the decline of those, uh, of the, the numbers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah right. Um, you know, you've got a whole transformation of, of technology, including transportation technologies, information technologies, everything that makes it easier for capital to flow, makes it easier uh, f uh, in fact, it's no longer the robber baron that we're looking at when we deal with, when we talk about capital. We're not talking about the, the, the identifiable individual capitalist sucking the blood out of the workers as we did in the 1920s and 1930s. It's not as clear anymore. Uh -huh. Now we have transactions taking place at breakneck speed by young traders, in, on bond, uh, bond traders on the floors of, of, of uh, 
of various brokerage houses around the world, around the world yeah, who are making touch making billions other. of dollars of decisions at a, a flick of a, of a of a computer switch. Yeah, many of these decisions uh -huh. not involving anything physical. It's all just speculative use and, and derivative. Not, and uh, none of them are, consider any social cost or any economic outcome, right. except maximizing the rate of return. Right. right. Um, so now we're in a situation where uh, each month, 12 times, in terms of foreign exchange transactions, the value of foreign exchange transactions each month is 12 times the value of the total world gross domestic product. Wow. Well, okay, so that gives you an idea of the amount of capital that flows. Yeah. But the state still can play a role. I mean, one of the excuses that's used in the Clinton administration and others are using, uh, it even goes down to the, to, the, to the city level, the state can play a role in regulating, not necessarily those flows, but the terms in which those flows take place. Uh, yeah, and, they sure ought to in the name of the national interest. In the name of the national interest. interest. I mean, that's what people are elected to serve, supposedly, although one wonders whether those national entities are as powerful as they were, multi-corporate multinational corporate boardrooms are more important than the political entities. But anyway, well, that's, 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 I think that's, that's completely true. Uh, Kevin Phillips' new book, yeah. uh, Spef, you know, discusses that. Uh, but in this context, it's very tough for labor. It's very tough for working <coughs> people. Uh, the competitiveness between industries is replicated in the competitiveness between individuals in, in the labor market. Right. Uh, and right now, we have a new economic index called the Job Opportunity Barometer. That's a very, yeah, talk where about we, that's we, very interesting. Where we put yeah. together a composite of various indices uh, that we feel captures what workers see when they look out there in the job market, in the labor market. And right now, our Job Opportunity Barometer is, is at the level that it was in the middle of the 82, 84 recession, uh, the 1982 recession. That was at the bottom. That was which a was, real heavy-duty recession. It was very deep. Yeah. Now, what do you include in the index? It'd be worth our index it's not just unemployment. Our indi index includes, of course, the unemployment rate. Right. But as we know, the unemployment rate is a poor proxy for job market conditions right. because if you work one hour this week, you're right. considered fully employed. By, 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 by the, the, by the government, st 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 by the statistics. One hour a week? One hour a week. Fully employed, right? Okay, uh -huh. so if you go from a 40-hour-a-week job to a 10-hour-a-week job, yeah. statistically you're the same. Has this been, con uh, let, me, let me ask you one thing, because I want to get at these, but have the means by which these statistics been presented to us remained constant yes, throughout the remained, time? Yes, they so have So these things have always applied. They have remained constant. And they still apply. It's always applied. The difference right. is, yeah that there are more of those 10-hour jobs now proportionally than there were before okay. versus the 40-hour okay. jobs. Yeah, okay. That's one. All right. Two, if you, if you yeah. go from a $700 a week job to a $300 a week job. Which is consistent, is more and more the pattern. More and more the pattern right. along with more part-time work. Right. Uh, then, it, again, it doesn't show up as, as, as any negative in, in the job data. Right. right. All right. So what my index does is we put the unemployment rate okay. together with real wages. Real wages. Real wages, uh -huh. after inflation wages, which uh -huh. have declined 20% since 1973. Ye gods. Even as productivity goes up. We put it together with part-time employment as a portion of the total workforce. Uh -huh. We put it together with temporary help agency employment as a portion of the total workforce. In other words, personal supply services, yeah. individual contract work which has skyrocketed in the Absolutely. last five years. Absolutely. The, 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 the largest employer in the country, I think, is the Temp Agency now. Yeah, Manpower right? Inc. Yeah, right. right. And we put it together with a Help Wanted Index because that gives, that's what people see when they right. look for a job. Right. So right now our index is 105. Now what does that mean? Is well, it, when we, compile, you, we have a base year of 1982. Right. 1982 is the deepest year of recession since the Great Depression. Yeah, that was damn near depression. And in yeah. 1982, the index was at 100. I see, right. So today, mm -hmm. going into the fourth year of an economic recovery, right. we're at 105. Uh -huh. A year ago, we were below 100. So that gives you an idea. Now that people are asking, why is consumer confidence so low? Uh -huh. Well, you can't, you know, the unemployment rate's falling and consumer confidence is still low. Why? Mm -hmm. Not only consumer, if I may, not only consumer confidence, but just general confidence on the part of the, uh, Kevin Phillips, as you say, and others have dictated. I mean, the election of 1992 was, in a certain sense, a, 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 an expression of the sense of angst right. that there is widespread in the society. Right. And I would submit that the one this year, the midterm election, no where question. Mr. Gingrich is just being installed 
today as we talk, uh, was uh, an exp a continuing expression of that sense of disquietude among the broad general society about the economic situation in which they find themselves and they don't see solutions. Right, right no yeah. question. And, yeah. and, and the public is very volatile when they don't have any significant options. Right. Uh, and they'll swing back and they'll swing. But, but what happens is what we're finding uh, is that e as economic insecurity rises, mm -hmm. And that's what this is. It's sure? economic insecurity. Yeah. Even in the midst of what we, we, we say is growth, people yeah. are still insecure. Five million new jobs, Mr. President said. Right. As economic insecurity rises, uh, so too does reaction, political mm -hmm. reaction. That is selfish reaction. Mm -hmm. That is, I need mine before I give to someone else. Right. It's easy to be progressive in an era of prosperity. It's yeah. much more difficult in an era of insecurity uh -huh. uh, for each individual. That's interesting. Progressiveness is the ability to be able to be more open giving toward our fellow human beings in a certain sense. That's a progressive thing. I would maintain yeah. that, that, that generally you have upswings in, in, in progressive legislation, upswings in union organization, upswings in those kind of, of movements more so in areas of prosperity than you do in, in areas of crisis. But now we have these increases uh, in productivity that seems to be going up. That is, the ability to produce goods and services uh, uh, continues to increase right. with these incredible technological revolutions, the microprocessor and all of these technological things that is making it possible for us to create more and more wealth. But, uh, but, we, but we seem to be caught in some sort of a dilemma. I mean... Um, you know, of not being able to realize it. And we have this, uh, this pattern, as you say, where they're all geared toward trying to the middle class. And we haven't brought up the fact of what we call traditionally the workers, or let's say the lesser advantaged people within our society, seem to have been completely brought out of the equation. I mean, Mr. Clinton just did a middle class tax cut or something. He tried well, the, you see, it's to a, those it's people a, but it's politically. A, it's a but the, it's anybody a, to the left of that, if that's the right term, or to the, the side of those who are less advantaged, you know, they seem to be completely ignored. The term Many the, of whom the, were the workers. I mean, the term middle class yeah. in society is, is really a, one of the, the, it's a real, true misnomer. I mean, okay. when we talk, it depends on what you mean by middle class. Clinton says it's anybody under 75,000 a year, mm -hmm. any family. Mm -hmm. Gingrich says it's anyone under 200,000. Mm -hmm. So there's a difference in definition. Now, I would submit that anybody under 75,000 is not middle class in the tradition. They're working people. Mm -hmm. $75,000 in family income, that means that you have at least, one, you may have two wage earners in that family. Yeah, increasingly uh, we do and yeah. need to have in order to keep your, yourself afloat. So it's really a working class tax cut, mm -hmm. but then the question is, is it a tax cut that amounts to anything mm -hmm. and what are the, what is the net effect of that? Um, but what we're seeing is that, that uh, People are looking for solutions, they're volatile, they're alienated from the political system, and primarily they don't see the political system generating any solutions for their basic day-to-day -day fundamental problems. Well, Mr. Gingrich might say now the revolution has arrived. The revolution has arrived, and he would say it with great gusto today, and, and he's I, very, very uh, certain that uh, it's, a, it's the government that is the problem. We have to do away with government and, and all of these... Um, aberrations to the marketplace forces that government intervention in the name of distribution by need and all of those uh, kinds of traditions do away with that and to establish a uh, what looks like to many people a sort of uh, uh, supply side uh, uh, Reaganomics redo. Yes, and that will intensify the problems. Mm -hmm. uh, it won't necessarily lead to the repudiation of the Republicans in 96, mm -hmm. but it will, lead, it will not solve the problem of declining incomes, of declining living standards. It will not... Or uh, the angst. Or the angst. Or the angst. It will not lead to new stability uh -huh. uh, in the economy. It will lead to new instability. We'll see new financial crises. We'll see new problems. Um, whether the logical political problems? Well, we'll see further and further polarization of society. You do see this definitely emerge. No yeah. question. Right, right. right. Um, there's no question. Uh, we're in a society where if you have a higher education, uh, you can live well. Uh, you can privatize. If you, you have can, a higher education and fit into the system, and you can live well. well of course, I'm assuming. There are probably some few who are educated well. Like they never let. Um, they never let. Um, uh, Vincent Van Gogh be accepted by the academy. Okay, well, you, you a, understand. Those are the exceptions. So there are a few. The people that have gone through the system, right, through right. the training, 
of the right. system. And, and subscribe to the system. And, and subscribe and, and perform and a function. Right. Okay. Uh, right. Okay. And th those folks uh -huh. can more increasing, uh, increasingly now, uh -huh. when confronted with a social problem, do what? Privatize the solution to that social problem. So, mm -hmm. for example, schools in my neighborhood are going down the tubes. What am I going to do? Mm -hmm. I move to the suburbs. Mm -hmm. If the school goes down the tubes there, I go to private school. Mm -hmm. If the crime rate rises, we bring in a private security force for our neighborhood. It's growing, um, it's okay. growing leaps and bounds. The Absolutely. point being that, 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 that people are not uh, solving those problems socially. They're solving them privately in their little enclaves. Yeah, for uh, themselves. For themselves. And uh -huh. then where they can't, where people don't have the money to solve them that way, uh -huh. New forces of regulation emerge. Yes, right. Gangs. Yes, that's right. Mobs. That's right. And so forth. Right. Uh, it's like uh, uh, there's a breakdown of civil society in many yeah. areas. Yeah, and that is beginning to happen, and it could be accelerated very, very precipitously. I, I think the Gingrich program will do that. You do. You sure. Do. So there's no solution, nor did Mr. Clinton. He had two years, and he did some things. Well, he would claim. He would say we're in a recovery. That we've made five million new jobs. That they brought the deficit down that they did these things that they were trying to do, you know, the many acts they did, but the, 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 uh, the elector, whatever it was, reacted in the way that they could with this election against him in this recent election. I guess we have to concede there was a Republican tide in this last election that is related to a, a way of the population expressing their, their, their upset with the system which might include the politicians of the Republican Party as well. It's just a way of expressing anger with the overall system, and that anger still continues. If you understand what I'm right. saying, well, you know, you see, what, what it is is they, 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 the, the irony of the whole thing is that Clinton did not, in fact, rule as an old line New Deal Democrat. No, no, not okay. at all. But that was the tag. Right? Yeah. That was the tag that the 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 Republicans put on him. Mm -hmm. Now, so in effect, Clinton's election wrecked the prospects for a real reprioritization, a real shift in government priorities, principally because he was identified with that liberal tag on the one hand, but not, did not, in fact, rule in that way. Did he not did produce not. He's a democratic leadership. Right, did not produce. Not. Did not produce the outcomes that he ran on. He ran on a program called "Putting People First. Mm -hmm. By day, I, I was the economy stupid. Yes, mm -hmm. I went to the Little Rock Economic uh, Summit. Mm -hmm. And the discussion there was at a, a very high level. It was indeed. It was a it repudiation was of Reaganomics. It was a repudiation of trickle-down. It was a repudiation of dereg. Mm -hmm. It was a repudiation of the bond markets driving economic policy. Mm -hmm. But within day one, within the first week of his administration, and it was reflected directly in, in his seating of Alan Greenspan next to Hillary in mm -hmm. his first State of the Union address, yes. uh, the bond markets ruled. Now mm -hmm. the question is why? Um, what we have today, when we, once we went off the gold standard, if you look at 1970, the 1970s, once yeah. we went off the gold standard, and once the flow of capital became so easy, yeah. capital markets truly do rule government policy in the absence of a strong state, a state yeah. that takes, uh, we'll get into what that means yeah, later, but a strong state. Yeah. Um, so what happens? Let's say Clinton, for example, wanted to pursue fully his program to tax the wealthy enough to close a deficit and produce jobs. Mm -hmm. well, you tax the wealthy on the one hand, on the other hand, the bond, bond market reacts. Right. Bond prices fall, interest rates rise. Mm -hmm. What happens? What you do with one hand to take money from the rich mm -hmm. is, er, is erased mm -hmm. through the rise in interest rates, which increases your payment on the national debt. Right. Okay. okay. So he's dealing with all of those forces. Right. Without a mass populace in motion, uh -huh. suggesting to the banking community, suggesting to Wall Street, suggesting to corporate America that it's better for us to have a social democratic solution of some sort mm -hmm. than to have anarchy in the streets. Well, well, without that, yeah. okay, well, they all the, want bond, to avoid the bond that, markets yeah. rule. Yeah, right. The bond right. markets yeah. rule. And that's what happened to Clinton. What about Mr. Clinton saying that uh, he saw this figure, and I don't know, maybe you can just, you, you can clarify it for me, but he said that there was something on the order of, did he say, you know, was I hearing him right, that was it 25% of, I guess he put it as income tax, that's not still 25% of the of government payments, are going 
for interest payments to maintain uh, on, 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 the, on the national deficit? And the 25, or was it income tax, or was it 25% of the government spending was going on paying interest rates on of government the revenue. bonds to 20, fin that finance the deficit? 25% of government revenue. 25% of government revenue. revenue. And the fastest goes to pay interest the, on, the, on the deficit to the bondholders who have stepped in to fill that right. deficit. Right. That's incredible. Right. That's an incredible right. figure. So if, if, if Wall Street doesn't like Clinton's program, Wall Street reacts with a drop in bond prices, which is the equivalent of a, of a hike in interest rates, uh -huh. which counteracts any deficit reduction. Okay. The other problem that you have is that a Democrat can never cut the deficit enough. The, the bond markets never reacted negatively when Reagan put the, shot the deficit up. Interesting. The bond markets did not yeah. go haywire. Right. There was no pressure right. from Wall Street because there was another feature of the Reagan program that gave them solace, which was freedom for capital to do as it pleased. Uh -huh. okay. Globally. Where globally sure. and in the U.S. Deregulation, right. the whole thrust right. towards freedom for capital. Right. The, in the post-Cold War period, it used to be that the, the, the Republicans could strike a deal with the Soviets, but the Democrats couldn't. Because if the Democrats tried to strike a deal with the Soviets, the Republicans would attack them from the right, right. Okay. as being commie sympathizers. Right, right, right. But the Republicans could do it because nobody could attack a Republican for being a communist. Yes, the, right? the Nixon going to China syndrome. So, so the Soviets were, would always prefer dealing with a Republican president than a Democratic president. Uh -huh. For that reason, they could strike a deal. Right. The bond markets always prefer a Republican than a Democrat. So in order for a Democrat to prove that he, in fact, is a worthy uh, president, he's got to cut the deficit more than a Republican in order to get the same outcome in interest rates. Well, Mr. Mr. Clinton has done a considerable and job Clinton, in cutting Clinton the deficit. Clinton has done it, and, and they still say it's not enough. Not enough, yeah. And they build up, what, $4.6 trillion or something? On a, Almost $5 trillion absolutely debt. Absolutely staggering, yeah. The biggest debtor nation in the world yes. we are, right? I'm just, I was wondering about that the other day. Everybody seems to say they're deficit. They're in deficit. State, local, federal, county, city, state, all the states are saying they're in deficit. I mean, who isn't in deficit? Well, in fact... Who isn't in deficit? In fact, Where is it all? In fact, state and localities netted out. All uh -huh. of them combined are in surplus. Uh-huh. Okay, that's so that's in terms of the government, in terms of government capital markets. Uh -huh. uh, state and local governments are, are in overall surplus. The big states in the Northeast... And in the West, which have had the, the real economic contraction over yeah. the last few yeah. years, are the ones that are, are being hit hard. Yeah. Um, but another thing, another example of, of this uh, kind of double standard is that now the business press is coming out against the middle class tax cut. Oh, even that? Okay, they're against that because it will what? Not Increase sure. the deficit. Okay, yeah, right. But what are they promoting at the same time? Boy, the ghost of Mr. Reagan sure is. What are they us. promoting? Yeah. He really did a job on this country. What are they promoting? You tell me, Greg. You're more... A capital country. gains tax. Greg. Yes, of course. Okay, so right. it's okay to cut tax right. on capital gains. It's right. not okay to cut middle class tax. Right, right. Same effect, Yeah. ultimately. Yeah. The theory behind a middle class tax cut is that you're going to cut my tax. I'm going to spend more. That's going to generate economic activity. It's going to increase the tax base. Yeah. That was well, Kennedy. That, that was Kennedy, 1962. Yeah. It worked when Joseph Heller did it. Joseph Heller, you know, he did that tax base. It seemed to have worked. We had a tremendous period of growth when Kennedy and Heller it did the tax cut. Yeah, it was a totally But when period. Laffer and, uh, who was it, Winiski and these guys came and did the tax cut, it didn't seem to work in the same kind of way. We built up this huge deficit, and we built up huge social inequalities in the minds of many. Uh, I think uh, Kevin Phillips, again, a Republican uh, traditionally, has uh, d documented this sense of disquietude there is in the, in the society in general. It didn't seem to work in the same kind of way, at least it seems to me, in that heady, optimistic way that it did back in the 60s. What's the difference? Well, the economy is quite a bit different. It's, right. it's, we're a globalized nation right. now, where mm -hmm. we weren't before. Uh, we were in a general period of prosperity, a general period of expansion, which we are no longer in. Um, but the president says we are. Well, is that incorrect? He said we're in recovery. We're in recovery, but the rate of growth is quite a bit lower in the 90s than it was in the 60s. Uh -huh. It's also lower than it was in the 80s, which was lower than it was in the 70s. We've uh -huh. had a, 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 a deceleration of, of growth rates. Uh -huh. Six by six, six increases in the in the in the interest rate. This what last year? Or yeah, something? last year six. Amazing. I mean, isn't the, is there is there any chance they're going to push it into recession? Are they going to push it? You know, they're going to push too hard on that, 
Or, and is there anything, Mr. Goldsmith was on talking against the uh, GATT, and, and he said they had to keep, they had to put the interest rate in order to attract foreign capital to finance our deficit for the bonds. Exactly. I don't know if there's any, you think there's truth? Exactly. I think that's, that's a heck I of a think state the biggest... for a nation to be in. We ought to be hanging our heads in shame to be uh, in such a compromised this, position. This goes, Shouldn't back, we? this goes back to that, that issue that I raised about the bond, capital markets determining economic policy. Mm -hmm. um, Al, Alan Greenspan says he's raising interest rates because of the fear of inflation. Yeah, where there's no sign. Clinton right? <laughs> says it's okay because of the fear of inflation. The fact is that the term inflation is a proxy for the value of the dollar. Okay. What they don't want to allow to happen is a plummeting of the value of the dollar. In order to maintain capital flows into the United States yeah. to finance our deficits, twenty-five percent. We need to have interest rates oh. that High are higher to than the to attract the capital. Amazing. That's the driving force. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, that's a pretty un unhappy thing. Okay, we've got these things. You're representing labor in a certain sense, or the labor people. So we have that. We have this internationalization of the marketplace with and, and I suppose this was growing it was inevitable World Trade Organization is going to facilitate the increased globalization of the market you have many people around the world who will on the labor side of the equation work for much less than it's possible for the trilateral workers of the world to work for and so they're going to locate plant and equipment to take advantage of those wages is that going to have a um, depressive effect upon wages in this country that they're able to go abroad and are the wages of the world going to come to uh, in a certain sense equalize themselves out so that since we have so much higher wages in this country than most of the world that all of the world will that we our wages the wages are going to have to necessarily go down and come in to be uh, in 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 sync with the world standard wages which is much lower than what we yeah, I mean, there, there's no question that wa wages uh, seek like water seek their lowest level right uh, you know and ultimately that will balance out um, there's a there lot are, of balancing to go on there, between the well, developed world and there are a lot of factors there's involved. people that pay 10 cents an hour or 20 cents an hour in some parts of the right, world but you also have to you have to you have to compare it to productivity levels as well uh, okay. okay so you okay. can't just take the the wage uh, you could you could compare wages when it's for the same actual output for the same actual work process mm -hmm. uh, in that case in manufacturing there are many areas uh, where you can't export the same job from here to Mexico and pay a tenth of what we're paying here like what uh, well, auto assembly, uh, why, why basic can't you manufacturing. Do that? Why can't you do that down there? No, I'm saying you can't. You can't. You can't. You can't. You can, yeah. you can't. But then there are more high value added production processes that you can't do down there simply because the labor force is not trained sufficiently to do, you do think, it. Do you think? Do you think that the training, Mr. Uh, Mr. Reich, will say that that we have to increase the uh, high? What they want to create are high wage, high skilled jobs. And that the, the, the work of the world is becoming so uh, needing of highly educated and subtle minds that they have to be trained. To, are the processes of economic activity, particularly when you've got these technologically augmented expert systems and so forth, are they really becoming uh, so highly skilled? I mean, there aren't that many people that are really rocket scientists <laughs> and so forth, if you understand, or Einstein's well, or something see, of that sort. Problem. And isn't it overdone? And I mean, a lot of the software programs are now being done in India, where they're very, very bright. People can be trained in a couple of weeks to do the kinds of things that have to be done. Or is that a problem or not? Is it, or am I wrong in that? That, uh, no, I think this, that this rationale think, of high skilled jobs is just a way to maintain a class based system based upon educational standards, certification, and the yeah, old boys. Club. I think that it was his way of trying to go through the back door mm -hmm. and get a progressive government policy. Mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is that it's a supply side labor policy. Mm -hmm. Essentially, what Reich says is that if we raise skill levels yeah. above the international average, mm -hmm. Or we raise them significantly above the international average, we will do what? We will attract capital. Mm -hmm. But that is, I'm going to have to say, that's, that's hogwash. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact of the matter is that, one, that theory doesn't hold water. Two, anything that the Clinton administration has done in the area of training or education doesn't even match to the, to the, nth, you know, to the tenth percentile mm -hmm. what Reich 
claims prior to him becoming a member of the government mm -hmm. claims is needed I see okay that. we can't yeah. possibly train that many people at those levels mm -hmm. to the extent that we can solve the problem of unemployment that we can solve the problem of declining wages. Or, or value-added activity by the name of labor in order to get and justify high wages. Exactly. The, mm. other, the other thing that he, he neglects in that is that if you increase the supply mm. of high-value-added workers, mm -hmm. that is, if you increase the supply of those technical elite, what happens to their wages? They fall. Mm -hmm. because this yeah, demand does not necessarily match supply. That's right. That was one of the great debates of economics. Yeah, right. um, so essentially what you're going to have is, okay, let's, let's flood the market with, with this, this new elite. PhDs in economics. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in economic electronics. And, and then let's drive, this, and let's drive the wage down. Yeah. That's one. Two, the theory assumes that higher produ more highly productive workers earn higher wages. And that hasn't happened since 73. That's not happened. Since 73, it always did. We've had a 25% increase in overall productivity since 1973 and uh -huh. a 20% decline in real wages. How do we account for that? We account for that by virtue of the fact that the structure of the economy is different. The power of labor is weaker. That is, traditional economic theory says that people get paid what their product their pay is dictated by their productivity. Yeah, well, productivity analysis is maybe going to have to be brought into okay. question. But anyway, that's, that's called marginal question. productivity right, theory. Right, right, right. Well, all uh, of our theories are based upon notions of productivity. But in reality, the labor market is a market based on power, as much oh. as it is on productivity. Oh. So if your power is reduced, no matter what happens to your productivity, yeah. uh, capital has the upper hand if capital has the threat of moving if capital is a, a threat, threat well, sure. yeah, yeah. Of, 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 foreign, of lower wages abroad. Right. If those threats exist, then leverage and power is reduced on the part of the workers, and they can't match uh, wage increases, productivity increases. Right. That's not in the traditional economic model. No, I think there is, we're in a time when maybe the traditional economic models are not really somehow working. There's a lot of people who are mystified by what's going on. I mean, economists and so forth are trying to understand what in the world is going on. The charts are going off the, the, where they're supposed to be and that sort of thing. I don't know whether or not, do you think, so we got this overseas competition and that uh, the ability capital has an upper hand and that sort of thing and that kind of thing. What about, uh, there are companies we look at, Michael Moore does it so beautifully with Roger and me and he, he did it with this recent one where he went to do a thing on corp aid, and he went and, uh, and, 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 and he mimics, but he mimics in a way that strikes a respondent chord because it's felt by so many, many people, the difficulty that we have, uh, that we have this, this thing, is, it, is this a euphemistic term, it's called downsizing. When the world did downsizing come into the language, and is downsizing the same as uh, firing or laying off, and it's been going in these large corporations to the numbers of tens to hundreds of thousands of people have been misplaced or displaced, and yet the productivity of the company still continues with fewer people. Yeah, one of the Is groups. there a problem of technological displacement of labor in terms of labor's contribution to a productive process which is becoming increasingly technological or capital-based in its uh, reality? With robotics and other kinds of cybernetic systems that make it possible to produce without the labor component being so crucial as it has been historically. Is that another problem in terms of this or understanding this uh, ability for them to downsize and the pressure upon wages and the pressure upon labor as a claim upon the national productive capability? That is a problem, but it's only a problem. Technology is not, technology may displace you yeah, in, your, not in your particular job or mm -hmm. an individual in their particular job. Mm -hmm. But that does not then mean that that particular individual cannot get a job somewhere else. Well, they did. They can't get a job somewhere else only when the overall market is stagnating. Well, traditionally, the agricultural workers, there was 90% of our people in 1910, Lewis Lapham tells us, were self-employed small farmers. Yeah. And then they were able to go into the automobile factories right. and so forth. But now... Right. They're going and they're reaching a point where with these uh, computers and these uh, computers, and, I mean, they're, they're now reaching a point where in, if they do get a job, if somebody is misplaced from the large either private sector or public sector fiefdoms, whatever they are, if they get displaced from that, they're almost certain and people feel that if they do get another position, it's going to be, if they get fired from a job at $14 an hour, they'll have to take one at $7 an hour. 
so that it's a downward scale rather than an upward scale, which adds to the well, problem. Now think and about what that says for the economy as a whole. Mm -hmm. If before you were making fourteen dollars, therefore you could consume fourteen dollars worth of goods. Exactly. Now so you're Mr. making Rupert seven. To say, right. You can only consume seven dollars worth. That's right. So technological displacement becomes compounded by the fact that the overall market does not yield enough employment. And it doesn't yield enough employment because there's not enough demand. There's not enough demand. You haven't got consumer demand right. to meet the market. Do you, do you think that, uh, and that's, a, that's going to be a real problem, because you really have to have a simul-financed kind of situation. You've got to have the, the demand. Say's law would say that the demand would create its, the supply would create its demand, but it doesn't seem to work uh, in the modern experience in any event. But you've, you've, got, you've, you've got this kind of, uh, you've got this kind of, a, of a situation that, uh, that is uh, that is emerging now, but can they go and instead? Could, do 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 you think that uh, they could have a, a two pronged approach where they they will exploit the markets in the third in the in the world as a whole? They'll develop well, markets. See, that's, that's the they'll idea. They'll get their markets in the world, and the markets here that were from the internal market from the high wages that were paid will be able to be able to be undercut because they're going to make it up in the third that's world. That's the idea that these And th that's what the World Trade Organization facilitates. Well, you see, you but have that a, spells well, bad well, we news have, for the workers and uh, what we have, earning peoples in the United States, doesn't it? What we have today is the contradiction between what's good for General Motors and what's good for the general welfare has never been greater. That is to say... Mr. Wilson said that. Well, Are you wrong? It, it, no, it used to be what was good for GM was good for America. And it right? isn't anymore. It's not anymore. Right, okay, that's okay, important. And it's not anymore because GM mm. can thrive. GM and they are. can well, do well yeah. as the U.S. economy goes down the tubes. That's right, and that because, seems to be happening. And that's what's happening. Yeah. And in fact, if you look at the Fortune 500, yeah. if you take the list of the Fortune 500 and you take their share of overall profits. Right, okay. Then you take their share of overall employment. Their share of overall employment has plummeted. Right. Their share of overall profit profits has skyrocketed. Let me ask you another question, if I could. That's interesting. That's interesting. What is the, if you take the 500, I'd like to ask you as an economist, you'd know. I don't know. I'd be curious to know. What, if you take the, let's say, the, 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 the instead of the 500, the 2,000, you say, take the 2,000 companies. What percentage of the gross national product, if we can measure things that way, gross domestic product, is accountable for by the Dow 2000, if there is such a thing, the top 2000 companies, in terms of actual production, not employment, but production. I don't have the exact number, do you have an idea ballpark? but it's, it's grown. No, do you have any idea ballpark? What I don't know the top 2000. No, the top 500 is about 30%. 30%? Do you think the top? Well, you couldn't make a ballpark no. in the top 2000. But, I mean, the point being that 500 companies out of 5 million. Yes, right. Okay. So what you see, is, what it suggests is that small business may be the engine of overall employment, but it is not going to be the engine of overall wealth creation. Right, exactly. So we have a problem. Mm -hmm. To the extent that corporate America, the large corporations, are able to operate without any restrictions, mm -hmm. are able to That's set their own policies, mm -hmm. are able to set their, the terms of, of the economic uh, okay. structure in sure. the United States, mm -hmm the wealth of, of the average American will decline. Yeah. Um, and that's what's happening, in fact. And, and, and you know, the, that's the, the other irony. I think that people are reacting to Washington in the 94 election, for example, a negative on Washington, when the fact is that Washington's power becomes less and less, mm -hmm. and that the real power exists outside of Washington. The real power in exists the in the corporate board boardrooms. Yes, yeah, yeah. right, right, right. And that's where they're, um, they're running the show. And there's, there's no countervailing. What about the possibility of there being an internationalization of the labor union effort? Uh, could there be a, uh, like we had 50 states in the United States and they got national unions rather than state unions fighting one another and so forth. Could there be a response to the multinational corporation as internationally by a, a, a union effort on the part of the workers of the world? And uh, what about an organization like the International Labor Organization in the UN uh, who said a long time ago, labor is not a commodity. Uh, they had the, is the, do they offer any hope? Are there any hopes on the international well, scale that there can be a countervailing uh, force by the part of labor and a, co a congealing of uh, the interests of the laboring peoples of the There's world? There's definitely more coordination now between unions internationally, more mm -hmm. than ever. Mm -hmm. Uh, is it enough? No. Okay. Is it enough to match the power of capital? No. no. Will it be? That's questionable. Okay. It's much more difficult to get people, to get humans together oh. 
to struggle together around a common program than it is to move capital. Sure, okay. absolutely, absolutely. Um, so and that's, particularly that's when tough. So many of those people are just wanting to become seen as uh, part of the management team themselves. You know, I right. mean, the people that they hire, they can hire, and then people become identified with these middle class, well, I'm part of the management, I'm not one of them. And as they see more and more people falling into the pit of lower, Barbara Ehrenreich wrote well, the fear of falling. Right. The people are fearful of falling into the pit of lower class status in the society that they'll struggle even more and do even more of the groveling or whatever is necessary to maintain their they bureaucratic position within the within the corporation. Right. It's sort of becoming in a certain sense, I heard one person say, like a post-industrial feudalism. You have corporate courts and then you have public sector fiefdoms and they're very bureaucratically organized and so forth right. and you know it I don't know, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no, but that's that's one of the ironies of our society, which is that we supposedly live in a free and democratic society. Not economic. Uh, but what most Americans, we've done some focus groups with, with workers around the country. Most Americans are not aware that the Constitution stops the minute they walk into the plant gate or the minute they walk into the office. That the Constitution does not operate on private property. Right. It operates in the public sphere. Uh -huh. So you don't have free speech at work. You don't have the freedom of assembly at work. You don't have those kind of freedoms. And the employer is all powerful. And in effect, you work 8 to 10 to 12, whatever it is, 10 hours of your day are in a dictatorship. That's interesting. There aren't any rights that extend by right of law and so forth? The writ does, of the state does run into those. Problems. Well, no, there are specific they laws. I mean, there's, for laws example, there's the National Labor Relations Act, which right. guarantee, supposedly guarantees your right to get together with your fellow workers and unionize. Yeah, that's right, exactly. Okay, but that guarantee is toothless. Okay. Why? Why? Because this is the penalty. Harold wants to organize a union. Right. Harold gets out there, he starts talking to his fellow workers. Let's organize, fellas. His employer says, Harold, bye bye. Yeah. You're fired. But you can't do that. For what you, you reason? Can't For do cause? That? You don't have to have cause? I'm gonna go to the steward. You don't, no, you don't have a you steward yet. Steward you don't anymore? have a steward yet because oh. you don't have a union. Oh, I see. Oh, you have the only union. people who have protection on the job in this country are people who have unions. Oh, I see. So only 11.5% of the private right. sector workforce has any protection. Right. So you can be fired. Now, is, that, is it legal for you to be fired for mm. organizing a union? No, it's illegal. Mm. But what is the penalty to the employer? Mm. Well, first, you have to file a charge with the National Labor Relations Board. Mm -hmm. By the time the National Labor Relations Board hears your charge, and let's even say it rules in your favor mm -hmm. two years down the road, mm -hmm. you've had to survive for those Absolutely, two years. Absolutely, yeah, and you can't survive. Then, the, what does the employer do? Appeals it to the next level. Right. It could take five years before you're ultimately cleared and you're ultimately reinstated. And how do you live in all that now, time? In that right? five-year period, you're probably working. Yeah. What is the penalty to the employer of breaking the law? It is back pay minus whatever you earned. Hmm. So the economic you mean incentive... You on another job? On another job. Good grief. So the economic incentive to the employer to break the law is tremendous. Uh -huh. It's much cheaper for him to fire you and lose ultimately, okay, and have to pay maybe 20000 or 30000 than it is to have the whole workforce organized and fight for higher wages. Mm -hmm. okay, so yeah, but then, and, there, and you're, also, you're also up against these, you're also up against these sometimes seen as inex inexorable forces of this international marketplace, and I would say this technological displacement which puts power on the side of those who own those machines. And makes the workers and scared. The, and the, and the, the ownership of the capital instruments, so the technology, is held by probably no more than 5% of the population. Nobody in our society thinks about getting income by the fact that they own some of the capital. They only have a labor relationship to productive process. And do you don't think there's anything to be said for the idea of maybe uh, working peoples or people who do not have capital, do not have the... G Newt Gingrich said that today on the television. He was saying, by what right do these people who inherited all of this money and live very well on the interest payments of the money not have to work? You know, but that, that, that so few people g gain income by owning the capital. But could, do you think we could expand ownership among the general society as a way of distributing income by something other than labor if there's this technological revolution that is uh, potentially well, displacing how, labor? How are you going to do it? Well, I, know, I, I mentioned to you on the phone, I don't have to go into it in great detail, but there is the notion of uh, 
ESOPs were brought in yeah. by Louis Kelso and Russell right. Long. Let me tell you how the, let me And tell then you. Uh, ESOPs are part, as is very often the case, are only just the tip of the iceberg of a system of economic analysis called binary economics, which is a different kind of thing that sets itself aside from all of the traditional economic systems that are currently operating. I mean, I would just say that. But In theory, yeah. that might work. Uh -huh. I mean, you could set up your own little society somewhere and make that work. Whether you can import that from above is, is, is questionable. I don't think you can. There's too many powerful interests at work. Uh, ESOPs are more prevalent today than they've ever been. Yeah, there's about 11 million people I yeah. in now, varying now, degrees. Now, why do they exist? Two reasons. ESOP is an employee stock ownership employee plan stock where the employees ownership. in varying degrees own the stock of the company. Yeah. They exist for, in two ways. In one way, a corporation brings in an ESOP. Now, the reason the corporation brings in an ESOP and allows employees to actually own stock is because there are tax incentives to doing so. Yeah, they got about 12 different pieces of legislation. Okay, so there are tax incentives to yeah, do. Yeah, right. One. Two, ESOPs come into play when you have lemon companies. When lemon companies are going out of business and you're in a town where that's the best job in town, the workers <laughs> then borrow money because the workers very rarely become actual owners. They're usually in debt. What it is is that the interest on that debt is tax deductible, whereas the interest on debt for the corp, uh, rather, oh, I'm sorry, the debt, the payments, I'm not an accountant, but the whole tax yeah, I know it issue yeah. is, uh, is favorable to the company. Uh -huh. um, and ESOPs come in when you when you have a comp company that's about to go bankrupt. Well, maybe maybe that, that that's a, that's another thing. That's a that, that that binary analysis is not understood or except or understood by one in fifty million people, and it's sort of off the radar screen of what's normally accepted, like with supply side and tax and spend and the traditional patterns of uh, which we look when we look at the political process. And maybe you know you could look at that in another in another context, almost philosophical in that sort of sense. And, but that <coughs> but I wonder what. Do you think? Why don't we just? We've got a few minutes left, and everything. What is going to happen with our country if these? Mr. Clinton has not addressed, as you said, I read in one of your newsletters, the interests of the workers, in or able to, in a certain sense, of the working class peoples, and that there's a tremendous constituency of people who are, as Barbara Ehrenreich said, going to increasingly be uh, either have. Uh, Tremendous pressure on their living standard and wages, and they're going to be going down into lower and lower class conditions. And there is the whole question of what we call the underclass, or the you know the uh, the, the 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 people in the urban ghettos and so forth. And it's now even spreading out into rural areas. What do you think is going to happen if the Democratic Party can't address them, the Republican Party can't address those issues, or don't, or are not able to? Then what do you see? Do you think there's a possibility of a of a of a, of a movement that is based um, in, a, in, a, in a revigorated labor movement or something? Well, like I that think sort? that's... Well, the what only, do you see as a... I, I mean, I think that's the only, the only possible positive outcome. Uh, whether that emerges today or, or ten, you know, five years from now or 20 years from now is the issue. Uh, I think it will emerge. I mean, third-party politics will become a major feature of American political life in the 96 and post-96 You period. see that emerging in this country. We've yeah, never I mean, had a labor party in this well, country. Well, I'm not even but... suggesting necessarily a labor party uh -huh. yet. I'm suggesting that, you know, the Ross Perot phenomenon and others like that will continue. Um, that we are in a political crisis in America. Indeed. The two parties cannot solve the problems of America. That's the the structure of government is a set up uh, and worked in an era of prosperity does not work in an era of decline. Um, Interesting. Yeah. And uh, we will have some back and forth pendulum swinging for a while. <laughs> uh, and then ultimately, something else will emerge. The question is whether the organized labor movement will take the bull by the horns at this point and say, wait a second, we are no longer going to spend tens of millions of dollars financing a political party that does not serve our interests. Mm -hmm. And we are going to look at new opportunities, new alternatives. And we're going to do two things. We are going to set up new political formations at the grassroots level and at the national level. And we are going to spend tens of millions of dollars trying to generate a more solidaristic, more positive, more progressive ideology in the society. All right, right. 
Uh, what, a, what, what issues could we address that would be in that sense? Well, Minimum wage. The, I was, How in the right world the does somebody tongue. live on four, what is it, four dollars and twenty-five cents an yeah. hour? How can anyone possibly, I mean, I, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, well, go ahead. No, I mean, there are, there are many, many things that government can do that don't cost government a dime. And that's one of the fallacies of, of the Republican critique, for example. If you accept that unionization was one of the key factors that led to the rise of real wages in the United States, mm -hmm. why not unshackle workers' right to unionize? For example, the, exa the example that I just gave you, right. that workers really do not have the right to unionize in this yeah. country. Mm -hmm. Let's give them that right. Let's right. give them greater freedoms on the job to get together to fight for higher wages. Oh. It doesn't cost the government a dime. As we have had. We have historical precedent for that, too. Exactly. And, but that was and people will remember. Yeah, but that, was, that, was, that was vitiated. Uh, after uh, PAPCO, uh, Well, even after the Taft-Hartley Act oh. and the Landrum-Griffin Act, 1947, 1959. All right. All right. Um, and uh, let's, let's do that. So let's do, the government can do something that doesn't cost taxpayers a dime, right. but will yield higher purchasing power. <coughs> they can do something else. They can impose a higher minimum wage. Uh -huh. Now, once again, in both cases, corporate power determines political power yeah. and determines legislative possibilities. Mm -hmm. So without a mass movement, that is, we need a movement for a living wage. We mm -hmm. need a movement for worker rights, for democracy on the job. Uh -huh. And uh, if you talk to working people about this, they will agree with this. Now, if you, get to work, if you get to working people and you go to working people, when you say working people again, in the middle class, and working class, you know, work, m middle, I mean, there, the, what about, there, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of people who are beyond all our safety nets or, or just barely beyond, you know what I'm saying? There's a lot of people, there's a lot of young people, they come along, they get a college degree, they can't find a position that's worth taking at all. They're flipping hamburgers, and the, as Michael Moore showed in this piece like that. So you have a great number of people who are there, uh, who, who, who are there, plus those leading up to and part of what is called the middle class that are in mm -hmm. traditional patterns, which if they're able, maybe they can get aboard the corporate ship maybe and be safe and secure, but they may be very well downsized enough. So you're going to have the, you know, from, from the left of center, or from the, you take the center, you take half of the, there's a huge constituency out there. Oh, sure. On that side of things, sure. the disadvantaged side sure. of our society, which is going to be increasing, that isn't being addressed in any political kind right. of way. And right? I mean, only 30, maybe it should be 30, labor. Thirty-eight percent of the uh, of the registered voters voted. Well, this time, yeah, this time. yeah. Um, the so, people, are but labor might be a labor. There is some cohesion, and there's you know solidarity between you people and so forth, and that. So that might be a core constituency labor is, could bring. Uh, a, 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 an alternative political uh, You know, with all its influence. weaknesses, it's still the largest institutional, uh, largest public institution right. through which working people have any kind of voice. Right. Um, and it's derided, and it's abused, and it's... it's uh, the media has attacked it. Attacked yeah. it. Right. Um, and it's principally because it, it does one thing. It cuts into corporate profits. Uh-huh, uh-huh, right. <laughs> and uh, cuts into corporate freedom. And they were able to do it. They were able to do it, which was something that they, they hadn't been able to do uh, in, in, in the past. So that they're, they're coming into that. So that they, but what, what is the, uh, do you think conditions have to worsen in the society well, that's the issue. Uh, before that kind of thing would be able to be understood? Or, uh, or, or uh, it will worsen, but in order to uh, invigorate the, the labor people to put forth this kind of, uh, of an influence. Oh, or to well. bull, Grab that bull by the horn. I, 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 I think that the change is going to come from down below before it comes on top of the labor movement. It's going to come from people in motion like it did in the 1930s. Uh -huh. uh, I, one of the interesting things of 1992 election was Clinton's election was based on the fact of a... Uh, broader anxiety right. than existed, say, in 1984. Exactly. Even though 84 was a deep, 82 was a deeper recession. Right. It, it was so concentrated on blue collar workers that the white collar professional workers didn't feel like it would no, hit that's them. Not us. Yeah, right. Now, now it's, catching it's up different. With them, yeah. Okay, so there's insecurity all the way up the corporate ladder. Right. Now. Oh. Uh, and that's creating a new political climate. Right. Um, and I think that also, that's a swing vote. It's a vote that is no partisan loyalty, yeah. per se, and swings based on immediate
perceived interest. And the number of people who are going to be able to, by their own direct experience, uh, associate with that because they've just been downsized or something uh, is going to grow. So there's a, and the basis and the core of the basis of organizing some sort of effective answer to that might be the labor union organization. Yes. And if I may, I'm sorry. Thank you. It's been your pleasure to have the perceptions of Greg Tarpit, Tar Tarpinian. He's executive director of the Labor Research Association here in New York City. Happy to have been able to bring you those perceptions. We could go on talking for hours easily, but that's it. We've run out of time, so Greg, thanks very much for Thank coming you, in. Thank you, And we invite you to tune in. We'll be coming back again next week on Conversations. That's it for now. Again, once again, thanks Take very, care. very much. See you next time.